And when it comes to NLP and machine learning and you know, artificial intelligence more, more generally, I mean, how, how much is that employed in extracting value from alternative data? Is it in the data preparation phase? Is it in the forecasting phase? Is it you know, more sort of standard techniques like your random forest SD boost, or is it sort of more advanced techniques like neural net and knowledge graphs were brought, was brought up in the last conversation. Where are we with using machine learning in, in capital markets and, and when it comes to, to alternative data you know, specifically? Uh, it's, it's used all over the place. Um, you know, a lot of times it's, uh, you, you know, we'll, we'll use it for um, forecasting, but more importantly, when dealing with large data sets, trying to distill it, trying to clean it, trying to extract, um, trying to extract information from it, um, that, that tends to be where most of the advanced um, techniques that we're using, it's in that kind of unglamorous phase of things. Um, in terms of forecasting, uh, oftentimes um, there isn't the amount of data needed to, um, to, to train um, the most sophisticated models. You know, if we're dealing with something like um, quarterly KPIs on thousands of companies and a data set only goes back a few years, it gets hard to train models that really like um, many millions of, of entries for training sets. Um, but I, I would say the, the answer is uh, it, uh, broadly applied and in every phase of the process. I think in what we do, NLP is a huge part of, of understanding workforce data. You know, a lot of this comes from LinkedIn profiles, job postings, Glassdoor reviews. There's so much free text in all of this. So I think the, the issues are not really in supervised learning. It's not so much can you predict this labeled outcome. You know, a little bit of a hot take, but I think supervised learning is getting a little bit commoditized. It's not really where, where the, the true value in machine learning is. It's, it's really in structuring the data so that it can be used in a nice, neat, tabular way. So if you see, you know, tens of millions of unique job titles, what are you going to do with that? You know, you, we can't give that to a hedge fund and say, here, go play with this and have fun. You know, we need to categorize things to a fixed number of occupations to a fixed number of seniority levels. This is just work that it wouldn't make sense for any investment manager to do that on their own. So getting, getting from a point of raw, unstructured, free text to a nice, neat data set that anyone can embed in a traditional analytics workflow takes a lot of unsupervised learning. You know, you need to create taxonomies, embeddings of words, job titles, skills, um, and you need to use that to create mappings to even uh, company IDs. Um, so there's so much NLP and machine learning that, that goes in under the hood, but at the end of the day, you want to deliver something that looks like a structured data set. Right, I was, I was going to say something similar. So the new field that's emerged, right, in trying to make sense of all of this data when you're applying machine learning in NLP is ML ops, machine learning operations. And, you know, one of the big thought leaders in the space, Andrew Yang, has a big focus on data-centric models instead of model-centric models, right? When, the, when, the, when this practice first emerged, uh, teams were trying to figure out how to make this work. They were dealing with very large, uh, noisy data sets. And they were tweaking the model as they went along, right? And we've seen that, uh, you know, with other data vendors, right? You can't tweak the model. You have to, you have to have a model that is, uh, you know, it has to be clear. It ha people need to know what's happening, right? You can't keep changing things over time. What you need is a really data-centric approach to clean, clean, clean data sets that are purpose-built, right? So just like you said, like, you don't want to give them you know, soup to nuts, the whole lake of data that you have, you want to give them exactly the data that they need to get to the answer to their question, right? And they'll use, they'll apply machine learning on top of that and they'll apply NLP. But if they don't have that core data set clean and they know exactly the provenance and how it was generated, 
then you know you really the the, the value becomes uh, it gets lost. Right. It's really important to have the ML operation, you know, yeah, yeah, in yeah. in place. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'll, I'll say from you know the perspective of AWS. I mean, certainly we're seeing use cases around you know structuring unstructured data, be it text or otherwise. I mean, another use case we're seeing is in the high frequency space, right? Where, mm -hmm. say, if you have an order book, you, you know, down to the millisecond or whatever it may be. I mean, that that there is so much data there, right? That you can actually it's sort of a, a fertile ground for machine learning algorithms and, and sort of you know, deep learning type, type approaches. Um, all right, just on, the, on, on just on the data specifically, maybe this is for you, Ben, and, and talking about sort of the macroeconomic environment right now. I mean, what, you know, you're seeing all this employment data. Um, what, what, what's it telling us? Because you, know, it's, it's, uh, you look at some data, it looks, things look pretty bearish. You look at other data, we seem like we we're sort of chucking along. What, what does it look like from your perspective, given the insights you have? Yeah, from a labor market perspective, things look pretty bullish. So um, we're seeing we're seeing a bit of a, a bit of a divergence between what's happening in asset markets and what's happening in the real economy. And so, w what I mean by that is like you know we even had in, in Powell's speech last week that you know we're seeing we're seeing rising aggregate demand and a very inelastic supply. So labor markets are restricted. We we still have not fully recovered to the labor force participation that we'd seen pre-pandemic. So there's restrictions there, but also we're seeing record high job listings, record high demand for labor, and record low layoffs. Even though we've seen some high profile layoffs happening in tech and in crypto, I think that, that just, you know, in, in, the, in the rest of the economy, layoffs are at an all time low. And I think that sort of underscores this point in a way that in the more speculative markets that are more linked to assets, um, we're, seeing, we're seeing demand pull back considerably. But of course, you know, the, the Fed has their dual mandate and wouldn't be, you know, uh, taking such an aggressive uh, stance on, on their forward guidance if, it, if they didn't feel like we were close to full employment and if there was some, some flexibility there. So I think we're feeling very optimistic about labor markets. And uh, of course, that's not all around. You know, some markets are doing better than others, and we can see you know, wage inflation um, by every job. And actually, any, uh, anyone want to guess what job is seeing the, the highest wage inflation? Anyone from the audience? Not data scientists, mm. I wish. <laughs> what? Fast food truckers. No, it's actually recruiters. And yeah, I think that's such an, it's, it's like kind of a funny job because it's a little meta in a way where when, when the demand for recruiters increases, that implies optimism about hiring more people in the future. So I think that that sort of supports this point that companies themselves are feeling like they will be facing more and more tight labor markets in the future.